Namaste. So after the simile of the chariot, the last two verses, 10 and 11, give a system of classification of mental states that can be used as a basis for a system of meditation. And how does that work? You just observe these different states and functions in yourself, and that will gradually take you higher step by step. So let me go over those two verses, and then we'll start from there. Verse 10, the sense objects are higher than the senses, and the mind is higher than the sense objects. But the intellect is higher than the mind, and the great soul is higher than the intellect. 11. The unmanifested is higher than Mahat. Purusha is higher than the unmanifested. There is nothing higher than Purusha. He is the culmination. He is the highest goal. So, it's all clear, right? <laughs> You know, it never ceases to amaze me when people watch these videos that they don't look up the terms. They don't look up the meanings of the words. I mean, how are you going to understand anything unless you know what the words mean? Huh? So I wind up having to explain everything like a school teacher, <laughs> which I'm not because I'm not very patient with idiots. But anyway, all the idiots can leave now because we're going to talk about consciousness. And if you've been watching this channel or following this channel for any length of time, which I hope you have, because if you just come every once in a while and watch a random video, you're not going to understand anything. We have a system, we have an ontology, a background knowledge against which everything is understood, uh, and it becomes the context. And what is that? the four states of consciousness. Here's the good old chart in its latest version. Now, I'm not going to explain it now because I've explained it so many times already. You should go back and find another video that explains it in detail. But what we're going to go into today is the same chart, but with different states of meditation and the method used to attain them in the order given in the Katapanishad, these two verses we just went over. So, okay. Any idiots left can leave now. So the lowest state of consciousness is Jagrat. That's waking consciousness of the things in the world. The objects are the body and various other things, objects, physical objects. So the meditation based on this is meditation on the senses, prana, with vital force in the body, and sense objects, since objects are higher than the senses, says the Upanishad. So what are the methods? Basically, karma yoga, vedic yajna, yogasana, pranayama, anapanasati, and other similar types of meditation where the attention is brought to the various parts of the body. Uh, Buddhism is especially rich in those kind of techniques. Qigong and stuff like that. Uh, Qigong is a wonderful technique because it bridges the gap between the Jagrat consciousness and Svapna. Anyway, let's go on. Svapna consciousness is dreaming. Its object is the mind and the thoughts in the mind. And the mind is higher than the sense objects, and intelligence is higher than the mind. So, pratyahara means withdrawal of the mind or the attention from the senses. Dharna, which means concentration. Dhyana, meditation. And bhakti. These are the techniques that work in this state of consciousness. And when we are meditating, it's assumed that we are meditating on something. And what is that something? Well, it has to be higher than the body, and it has to be higher than the mind. So these would be the deities. This is where bhakti comes in. You choose a metaphor, 
a symbol, a form, a name, and a world, a loka, and pastimes that you find attractive. And you worship them, you meditate on them. And this is called bhakti. So you can have bhakti for Vishnu, or Shiva, or Shakti, or Brahman in general, Aum. I mean, there's so many transcendental symbols of the Absolute that bring it within form. And one might say, well, this is just imagination. And yes, it is imagination. In his commentary on Bhagavad Gita, Shankaracharya explains, Worship of the deity is an act of imagination where we imagine that the symbol of the personality of the God, whichever one we prefer, is identical with Brahman. This is also called projection, huh? superimposition. Superimposition is actually how we imagine our existence as an individual in the world. Now, that's a deep subject. We're not going to get into that right now because we already have in many other videos going back years. So the point of bhakti then is to imagine a name and form of the absolute and worship it. And the reason for this is to discharge our debts to the gods. We cannot go past this step until they release us. In other words, within this universe, there are many higher authorities. Ultimately, death or virat. And they are the ones who determine whether we get to go beyond a certain stage in the path. And that is the stage of which we can imagine in our minds. So some people think <laughs> wrongly that if we can imagine that we are Brahman, then we are Brahman. But no, that doesn't work. That's called Neo-Advaita. And we've gone through this many times, how completely wrong and off it is. The actual process, the actual path, is that we worship these higher authorities until they're pleased with us. And then we get everything. Wealth, health, intelligence, knowledge, opportunities to advance spiritually in so many ways. And this is the only way we can get past this particular knot or granti in the path. The next state is sushupti, or deep sleep. The object of sushupti is shunyata, or emptiness. And this is called the unmanifested, maya, and mahat, virat, hiranyagarbha. These are all names referring to the same level of being, the same level of manifestation. So this is the stage we have to reach before we are freed of the upadis, the coverings that make us imagine <laughs> that we are an individual, that we are a living being who gets reincarnated in the world and is subject to the law of karma, cause and effect, and that we have to work so hard to get all these results and like this. This is all an illusion. It's all complete maya. The actual truth is we get the results of our activities in previous lives in this life. So whatever we have done in previous lives, that result is what happens to us in this life. There really is no free will. It's all happening by karma, by cause and effect. So we have to perform pious activities in this life so that in the next life, we have good opportunities and good facilities for further spiritual advancement. Or even better, finish it now. Finish it in this lifetime by Raja Yoga, the process neti neti, meaning not this, not this, Huh? Uh, various other uh, techniques in Qigong and Zen meditation where we come to the awareness of emptiness, nothingness, shunyata, the void. 
This is, I mean, a, a very scary thing. If you've never experienced before, or if you don't have the, the background of good karma to be able to withstand it, uh, it can really mess with your mind. <laughs> there are all kinds of horror stories of people going on meditation retreats and having psychotic episodes, psychotic breakdowns. This happens because they come into contact with shunyata before they are prepared, before they have the background to be able to deal with it. I remember it happened to me back in 1984. Just before I was visited by Shakti and given the first path enlightenment, which has been my mainstay ever since. Uh, this is a view of Brahman in the world and the world in Brahman. So this is a wonderful experience, but it only comes after one has mastered the void. So these are really essential techniques. And then finally, Turiya consciousness is transcendental. It is that consciousness which is aware of the inferior Brahman, Brahman with qualities, Saguna Brahman. And the meditation is on Brahman as the Purusha, or the personality of Godhead. How is this different from Bhakti? Well, in Bhakti meditation on God, one conceives that I am different from God. God is different from me. Uh, we're two different beings, and we have this relationship. Whereas in this level, the meditation on God is called Ananya Bhakti. I am He. He is I. We are one. Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman. And this is the height. This is the pinnacle. This is the goal. This is the target that we're trying to hit with all these meditations. Now, you cannot simply jump up to the top level. If you do, actually, it's just imagination. And so it's not sustainable. You'll fall down. So you have to go step by step from where you are. And most of us start out at the very beginning thinking, I am the body, <laughs> this world is real, and it's the process of cause and effect and so on is uh, valid, and, and this and that, uh, physics and chemistry and all that stuff, economics and politics that we have been programmed with, conditioned by. These are all upadis. These are all coverings. And to remove them, we have to get the mercy of God. But first, we have to develop concentration, the ability to pull back the mind and the attention from the senses and the world and focus them within, on the self. This is the most important thing. Otherwise, the other higher stages of meditation won't work. So once you learn this, Bhakti will appear spontaneously. You'll be spontaneously attracted to a certain form of God. And similarly, after practicing Bhakti or similar uh, practices on that level for some time, you'll be attracted spontaneously to meditation. It will just arise naturally. Huh? And this is the time when you get involved in the higher forms of meditation. And the same goes for the final thing, the final stage, that when your meditation on the unmanifested, the void is mature and you're comfortable in the void. In fact, you'll come to see it as the greatest shelter, the greatest refuge from all suffering. Then Brahman will arise spontaneously and you will realize, oh, I am he. He is I. We are one. And this is the peak. This is the goal of meditation. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.